Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. You're joining me, Jason Pizzino, on my channel, Jason Pizzino. I do that because I like to say my name twice. Anyway, let's move on to today's video and you can see by the title, I've, I've given it something like uh, how to lose $240 million or $6 billion lost or, you know, the world is not coming to an end, something like that. Anyway, I'll, I'll, you would see it by now. Uh, Anyway, let's move on to that video. But first, before I jump into that, uh, I want to let you know that this is on a podcast as well. You can get the link down below and you can listen to me in fast time, you know, speed it up or whatever, because uh, I, I understand some of these are a little bit lengthy that, you know, 15, 20 minutes and you can condense them a little bit. And, uh, you know, if you're watching it, obviously that's what you can do. But if you are listening to it on the podcast, thank you very much for joining me over there. You can obviously check out the video and just see the uh, the newsletter and stuff like that that I'm, I'm reading from um, on the video. So. There's the two formats. Today, we're going to touch on the whole point that the world isn't coming to an end because that's what we tend to hear year after year after year. And it's been, you'd be familiar with it uh, by now uh, if you're watching, you know, you've been watching my channel for a while. I talk about Phil Anderson's work quite a lot, uh, Austrian economics. I've had some people say, you know, you should check out, um, I forget what they said, but it's mainly around the point. You should check out different sorts of ec economics and, you know, study this one, study that one, have a look at it all. Sure, it is a good idea to get a broad idea of what's going on. Uh, in this case, I tend to just work off Phil's stuff because he has been the most correct, or he has been almost like spot on for the last, I'd say, five years that I've been following him. I, I think I first found him around 2012 or 13, so yeah, five or six years. Everything that he has said is spot on and it's... It, when it's, uh, you know, contrary to pretty much all of the news media, um, he's still spot on. Like the news media has to sell papers. Uh, I'm pretty sure you, you, you get the gist of that. They have newspapers to sell. They've got TV slots to, to fill, you know, advertising space. TV stations are just advertising space. Like that's how they make their, their money. So they've just got to play something on TV that gets more views. And obviously bad news gets more views. We should be aware of that by now. So the more that these media companies keep playing bad news about the world's coming to an end, it, uh, you know, it gets more views so that they tend to lean towards those sort of investors that think the world is coming to an end. On the other side, there are the people who are making money and the world isn't coming to an end. And you know, we've got, I've got quite a few charts here to go through and you can just see that the markets have continued to increase every year that these guys have said the world's coming to an end, the world's coming to an end. I think I'll stick with a few of the examples who are on uh, YouTube for the most part and they do make their, some of them, not all of them, they do make their appearance on news media TVs, whatever it is, you know, Fox News or CNN or uh, whatever junk is on TV, Sky News, I don't know. Um, the main, main names, and I'm not saying that I don't like some of these guys, like I like Jeff Berwick, but he's all about the world coming to an end. Um, probably in a slightly different way to the other guys uh, that I'm about to read out. So there's like Peter Schiff. He's a, a gold digger, not necessarily, but uh, he likes the proposition of gold holding that, doesn't like Bitcoin, doesn't like any of that sort of stuff. He's just gold it is and the world's going to come to an end. And he's, if you go back on his channel, he's been calling the end of the world every single fucking year since the last top that we had. So we're in 2018 now, coming to the end, August, so mid, you know, coming to the end, still thinks the world's coming to an end. It didn't happen last year. It didn't happen 2016. Didn't happen. Anyway, you get the idea again. He's he's terrible for that. Um, also, on YouTube, there's, there's lesser known guys, smaller smaller channels, and they don't really do too much apart from read out news articles like I do on the internet and then post them up on their YouTube channels. Um, J Snip Four, I think that's his uh, his handle there on YouTube, and then also Bix Weir. So he's his like road to Ruder. Again, uh, and to go with those two is, what's his name? Cliff High. So those guys, you go and look at their channels and you can just see back the timestamps every single fucking year, every single video, the world's coming to an end, the world's coming to an end. And the way to, uh, you know, to get yourself prepared is, I don't know, buy silver, buy gold, buy Bitcoin, those sorts of things, you know, move all your stashes into those, uh, into those platforms. But obviously, we can see over the last eight months since cryptos hit a massive high in December, January, you know, we've tanked a good 80% or so. Um, a lot of cryptos have hit that mark, some 70%. But anyway, it's a lot of money lost if you got in at those later stages. Um, regardless of that, it's still 
not a good idea to be following their advice that the world's coming to an end when it hasn't come to an end and they've been calling it for several years. So there, there are some of the names there. The bigger guys that most people would know if they're in the, you know, any sort of investing is someone like George Soros, who I'll talk about in this, uh, this email here, in this video, obviously, this podcast. Um, Phil brings it up and it's in some news articles, just looking back at people's history and what calls they've made. So I guess that's the gist of it. I think you're going to see the idea if you really dislike that. I'm sorry, I, I'm not in the bear camp for the market. Eventually, it will have a correction, and I think that I know when it does that. I'm not saying that it will 100% happen, but I've, I'm, as I said, I'm following Phil, the economist here. It, when it does happen, it will catch people off guard, and they will call that the end of the world. So, mark my words. That's a famous last line of a lot of the crypto Facebook groups. Mark my words. This coin is going to the moon. Um, mark my words. When the next correction, not the crash. When the correction in the markets happens, people will say, see, I told you so. Phil is scheduling that for 2019, end of that year, possibly 2020, 21. That's when it will actually fall. So the top will be next year, probably mid to late next year, but it'll actually fall. And you won't really know that it's a bear market until later in the cycle. So it could be falling for half of 2020, but it might just look like you know, correction, and then it starts to take off. And at that point, then you can say, oh, okay, well, the top was six months earlier in, um, you know, late 2019. That's when he's saying that this correction is going to happen. It could last one or two years, and at which time we'll hit a bottom and then take off again to even bigger highs. But that's going to catch everyone off guard who is in this bear camp. I am sure of it. I've seen it once before in my lifetime that I've been involved in the markets. I, at that time, thought, you know, maybe, maybe we are not going to make it back. But really, what, what else is there for the, uh, you know, the, the powers that be to control? Things can be different. Things can change. We, we understand that. So we'll, we'll take a you know, hedge against it as well. But generally speaking, that's what's happened year after year, cycle after cycle. And, and f again, if you've been watching, um, Phil's reason for that is it is property-led cycles. So until property isn't a, you know, like a privatized commodity that people can speculate on, he believes that that's when that's why these cycles continue to happen is because property is a private um, you know private commodity that's speculated. So until that's not the case, then we will continue to see cycles. So let's move on to the newsletter, and uh, this one's dated 30th of July. I've got another one coming up as well. I, I keep these in my inbox because I really want to make a video on them. I, I just think they're so interesting. The way it brings a bit more of the just things that he's learned or you know read and studied along the way and mashes them in together to show a side of human psychology that we tend to miss when we get caught up in the hype you know the fomo of missing out or in, in investing or the fear and that sort of stuff so uh yeah i just like how it all it all mashes together so let's go on here 30th of july he's uh, looks like he's in london this time phil editor Dear Jason, on the 22nd, so this starts with a little story here for those who are listening and can't read on. A um, little story here. On 22nd of October, 1843, more than 100,000 people in the US made every effort to find high ground and wait for a cosmic sign that would signal the coming of their Lord and Savior. The Millerites, as they had become known, had been told to do so by the charismatic preacher William M. Miller who's been preaching for years about the coming of Armageddon. The coming Armageddon. Miller had used his Bible studies to contend that the advent of the second coming of Jesus has been revealed, as he put it. It was time for his followers to finalize all their earthly affairs and wait for their Savior to take them to their new Jerusalem, the, new, the, uh, the name Miller had given to heaven. Miller had been preaching since the early 1800s and had gained quite a following. So I'm glad I gave that bit of a background before this video. You can start to piece these together of how human psychology doesn't change. It's so fucking uncanny. And myself included, like, we still get caught up in it. Uh, and if you can just see that, you can make way better decisions in life, especially in investing. Okay, back to the newsletter. Uh, his message became known as the midnight cry, the return of the bridegroom, or the date of the advent, as Miller came to call his own belief in the second coming. Alas, the day came and went, as you know. This should have been the end, said Miller afterwards. So he did... Uh, so he redid his calculations and discovered a slight error. The advent was going to be 1844, so not 1843. This new interpretation 
became known as the seventh month message or true midnight cry. Alas, the following year, 1844, also came and went, but it hasn't stopped his followers from their continuing belief in the advent or second coming. Today, they are called seventh day Adventists. Who are vegetarians, by the way? Uh, why is it so many people think the end of the world is coming and so to the end of markets? The heavy hitters in current markets, the hedge fund managers and people like them do this all the time. Don't follow them. It can be really bad for your bank balance or even worse, it can paralyze you into it in action. George Soros, here we go, recently turned bearish again. He's famous for shorting the UK currency back in 1993 and reputedly making a squillion. However, I'm not aware that too many of his calls have been right since. If you have ever followed George Soros over the last 25 years and you think he's made some excellent calls after that point, leave the links down below. I'd love to see that. Feels pretty good on his work, so I don't think that's I don't think there's really much out there. Soros has been warned, sorry, Soros has warned yet again this time back on 29th of May. So this is a full two months after uh, that warning. This is when Phil's newsletter has come out, the one that I'm reading now, of a looming financial crisis and an existential threat against the EU. Another old man, I don't know why he put white in there. What's his, what's his deal is there? Anyway, I'll read it as he's written it. Another white old man getting grumpy, if you ask me. We saw the same with Jim Rogers every year since 2012. Six years later, forecasting continual market chaos and collapse. It's just preposterous. Anyway, here's a pic of the latest Soros headline from back in May. Uh, so yeah, you can see a little picture here that, that um, he's taken from the news article. It's called, As Soros Foresees Financial Crisis. Here are his European shorts. So you can see that, the date, May 29th, 2018, by Nishant Kumar, N-I-S-H-A-N-T, Kumar, K-U-M-A-R, for those of you who are following on the podcast and want to check that out. Sources Bloomberg. Since then, the Nasdaq has broken into all-time new highs. Even the Australian market hit 52-week highs recently. Nasdaq, we're going to look at that as well. When a stock market hits a new high, hits a new high, it means the wealth of that nation is increasing. It means the corporations involved, as measured by that market, are increasing their earnings. You don't get a financial crisis when that's happening. You just don't until the real estate cycle has completed. Speaking of the perennial bears, whatever happened to those China bears? I remember that as well. China, people going on about that several years ago, that end of the world's coming, China's going to blow up, the rest of the world's going to follow suit. Anyway, you know the ones, all the hedge fund managers that absolutely, totally believe that China was going to collapse back in 2012 and told you to back their belief with your money. So this is the important part. This is the really interesting part. Pretty much where the, the title of the video comes from. Jim Chanos was one. Remember him? In 2012, he said China was in a bubble. That was on Bloomberg Television, 3rd of May. Sorry, my neck's getting a bit stiff here. All right. In 2013, he said it was, it was now the best time in recent memory to get short in China. That was on CNBC, 19th December. Again in 2015, he said China's model was broken. He's still at it. Looking at China, I, I can't wait. Let's have a look at quick. I've got a chart here. There's China. So 2012 was around this top here, that, that area. Uh, you can see that first big spike. Anyway, you, you'll be following the podcast. It's going to be a bit hard. But uh, yeah, he called the end there. Sure, it had a nice big correction, but it doesn't really change the trend where it's still up. We still have higher lows every year. There was another one, 2015. So there's that other little spike there. Um, now it looks like we're, you know, we're starting to head down and we didn't get a, a new uh, higher top there. But still yet to be seen. It's definitely not the big falls that, uh, that this hedge fund manager is talking about. Uh, well, the end of the world, they were some big falls and you could make some big gains from them, but the end of the world, we know China's still going It's six years later. So this is his quote uh, on Bloomberg back 19th of May, 2017. He came out and said, stresses in China, uh, China's banking system are becoming more apparent amid the mount mounting pile of credit extended by the nation's lenders. I've watched quite a few things on China and their economy. They don't work the same as we do because we, as in Western societies and our banking and government systems, because they're a communist country. Like they control shit way more, you know, with their finger on the pulse way more than, than, than we do with our semi, you know, quasi free markets. Um, do these guys ever give up? Not until they run out of money, it seems. Hedge fund manager Paul Hart spent seven years and $240 million dollars waiting for a crash in China. So if you put your money into these hedge funds, not all of them, obviously, but there are some of them who are perpetual bears in a time when the markets are going up, you're going to lose a lot of money, depending on how much you put in, obviously. 
Specifically, he was betting against China's currency. Bloomberg reported on 7th of September 2017, the trade went against him almost from the beginning. After holding steady for the first six months of 2010, the yuan strengthened for the next three and a half years. It eventually reversed, reversed course, but the sharp devaluation that Hart had anticipated never materialized. His second China fund shut in December. All told, he lost between $240 million and $250 million, quarter of a billion dollars. Not the way to make a fortune. It's trading against the trend, not to mention betting against the Chinese government. <laughs> That's a big one, isn't it? But wait, there's more. How much can a market bear really bear? The answer is about $6 billion. A financial t the Financial Times reported back in October 2017 that funds manager Crispin Odie placed some poorly timed bearish trades during the past several years, betting on a total economic collapse that in a very short time turned $12 billion of clients' money into $6 billion. They lost 50%, and that is in traditional markets, not in a, a raging bull market in crypto that turns into a bear. Like These are traditional markets which are very hard to make money in. Here's how it was reported. A string of ill-timed bearish trades and client outflows have slashed in half the money managed by Crispin Odie, one of London's best known hedge fund figures. So a string of ill-timed bearish trades and client outflows. So possibly that's combined the, the losses and people taking their money out. Uh, moving on. The outspoken investor who was a prominent backer of Brexit has seen the assets in his flagship Odie European fund fall from $2.5 billion at the start of 2015 to €184 million. Euros. Okay, so it went from €2.5 billion Euros at the start of 2015 to €184 million, Euros, according to the fund documents. Total assets managed by Odie Asset Management, which include funds not run directly by Mr. Odie, have fallen from $11.7 billion at the start of 2015 to $6 billion at the end of August. Imagine that, $11.7 billion in funds under management at the start of 2015, down to $6 billion by the end of August 2017. Two and a half years. All 2015, all 16, half of 17. In that time, that was the whole bull market, or a few, short of a few months, um, of Bitcoin and cryptos. I don't write this to highlight the woes of another market participant. Trading markets can be a tough business. I write this to tell you that market knowledge is important and it, and it can be really profitable if used wisely. So there's no need to make a tough business even tougher than it already is through ignorance. At the very least, you can understand how the real estate market works. There's a very clear real estate cycle at work here. All right. This is, as I've mentioned earlier in the piece and with every other video, it's always tying back into the property cycle so that we can see the examples play out during the process of the cycle so that we can make better decisions in our, in our own investing. I've been long and loud in telling everyone I know that the US economy and by extension much of the rest of the world sees a very clear 18 to 20 year real estate cycle. History is very clear on this. I even wrote a book about it called Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking. You can check that out on Amazon. Now for the steak knives. Yet another short lost his shirt late last year as the US market shattered records and went from highs to even higher. I told you they would, and he did in all of the videos uh, from last year. I've mentioned that it would be going up. That's obviously Phil's work, and he's been saying that since the bottoms in 2009-10. Hugh Hendry, one of Britain's highest profile hedge fund managers, is winding down his flagship fund amid sustained losses, according to a letter to investors seen and quoted by the Financial Times back in November of 2017. Hendry's fund shrank in size from $1.3 in assets under management in April 2013 to $30.6 currently. Hendry gained prominence thanks to his bets against banks during the financial crisis. So he got it right in 2008, lost it all again 2013 to whatever recently it was, 2017. That's a lot to lose, man. That's, you can pretty much say you lost it all if you got $1.3 and then you're down to $30 million. These guys were trying to short markets at one of the strongest times in the real estate cycle. This wasn't hard to know. History showed quite clearly, and before we got there, that from 2010 to today, it would be a time to be bullish. Now, imagine that what these guys would have could have been worth if they'd put all their funds and that of their clients into Bitcoin. Oh, shit. I just said that earlier. <laughs> if you listen to these bears all the time, you were doing yourself a grave disservice. Here's why. In 1917... 
if you'd been wealthy enough and smart enough and weren't listening to all the bearish war talk of the era, so that was around World War One, to put $1,000 into the top 100 public companies of the time, you'd now have $26.6 million in your portfolio. And that's just based on the price only. It doesn't include dividends you would have collected along the way. Now, okay, who had a grand back in 1917? But stick with me for the point of the exercise. All right. Uh, $1,000 to $26.6 million is a 5.8% compounded annual return over the 100 years. If you add in all the dividends accrued, you'd be a billionaire, 10% compounded annually annual return. So he's just doing it for a number's sake in the, in, in the sense that small things can turn into big things uh, if done well. And there's been two world wars, a Great Depression, the Korean War, Vietnam, several recessions, 9-11, and the GFC since then, among many other scarce, scares and fears. Nearly coming to the end, guys, I was on the podcast. That's not to mention some serious epidemics, the Spanish flu that killed millions, SARS, Ebola, and the fact that we're all going to die from an asteroid shortly. Or maybe not. There's always a reason to be fearful. It's never ending. Stick to the real estate cycle. It will hold you in far better stead. The time for you to panic is when absolutely everyone else in the world cannot see a downside, like what happened through 2006 when Paris Hilton ruled the world. Who remembers that? I remember she had her own TV show as well. That was weird. Such a time will come again. 20... 25 and 2026 perhaps but not currently best wishes phil anderson that's just the weekly update i think he gives about two or three of those a week so there you have it that is the newsletter this time that's the news about the world isn't coming to an end that's how you can lose hundreds of millions if not billions of dollars by trying to short markets or you know these guys have got billions hundreds of millions have to build positions so they would probably be selling at market tops rather than buying it market dips and as the market keeps going against them they've got to keep covering their positions so that's possibly how they've lost a lot of money it's a bit sad for those involved in that side, but you know, there's, there's a winner on the other end and that's people who have been longing it. Quick look at the charts. We just looked at China's there. This is the S&P index. So one of the main ones in the US. Look at that chart. This is these highs here. These are the GFCs. Well, GFCs, there's, there's one GFC. That's that one right there. 2008, seven top. And you can see it crash. It took out the low uh, between, what was that? 2003, I think, 2002. Yep. Um, but now we are very, very, a very, very long way away from those highs of the GFC tops. That's crazy. So yeah, we're, we're a long way from that and we continue to go up. So he's saying we're going to keep going from there. Uh, quickly, another couple, because I know that I've been talking for a long time now. Uh, let's move on to the NASDAQ. And NASDAQ took out even the tech rec bubble of 2001, 2000, sorry, 2000, 2001, that took out the highs a long time ago, many years ago. We, uh, we broke through that in 2015. So we're three years on from that and we're just shooting to bigger and bigger highs. This is probably where we need a correction at some point and that's like next year or the year after. We don't know, but it, uh, it's not a bear market. That's not a place to be shorting the market. Quickly, the Nifty. And Nifty is the, the Indian stock exchange. Nifty is at all time highs as well and the UK market. It is at all-time highs. It's not as strong as the, the last few markets, but it's, uh, it's hit all-time highs this year. So that is looking pretty good. All right. Thank you very much for watching on YouTube and listening to my voice on the podcast. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that one. Let me know what you think. I'll keep them coming because I pretty much enjoy them myself going through it and talking about it. Uh, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Um, I have another one coming up probably in the next week or two. So stay tuned. Remember to hit subscribe and follow the podcast down below. And uh, yeah, like the videos, comment below, even if it's all new and over your head. Let me know what you think. Any questions you've got, I'd, I'd be happy to have a discussion and help where I can. So uh, yeah, drop it down below. And also, if you're doing any investing yourself, let us know what you're into. Leave that in the comments and I will chat to you there. So you know where to catch me. Thank you very much again for subscribing, liking, and all the good stuff and watching, and I'll see you at the next video. So until then, take care and peace out.